to leave us and head out to your groups. I know you've got a lot of good stuff coming up, so have a lovely time. They can't get out quick enough. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> Fantastic. I always get excited and think it's a sign of a church with a great future when you announce Sunday school in half the congregation. It uh, gets up and goes out. So we're in a good place, and we thank God for that. We had a uh, leadership team away day uh, recently, uh, last week, week before, and uh, really good to have time to go away together, spend time together, uh, seeking God and, and sussing out where we go as, as a fellowship. And uh, some of the things that we discussed will, be, will come up more uh, in our church meeting in a few weeks' time. And so I'm not going to spoil those surprises. Um, one thing we did on our day away is we uh, did a, I don't, know if, I don't think you're allowed to call it that anymore, but we did a brainstorm. Uh, if anyone's offended by the term, forgive me. We did a brainstorm of all the uh, strengths and the weaknesses that we uh, felt within the church. And uh, that sounds really boring. Uh, it, was, it was important to do, and it was a good thing to do. And this morning... Apologies if you're new and visiting us. Um, it is great to see you. Don't disappear at the end. I'd love to, love to catch up with you. Uh, this morning, I would love to just take a moment to reflect on one of the areas that was identified as being a weakness. It's a subject that we're not very comfortable talking about. It's something that makes uh, a number of people a little bit uneasy and is often a bit of an awkward uh, no-go area. Now, hopefully, you've known me long enough to know that I don't do no-go areas. And so we're going there. <laughs> uh, and that's money. Money. You see, in church, we're, we've been put off talking about money. Most preachers don't talk about it often, and most congregations don't like it talked about often, so there's a happy kind of silence that goes on there. There's a whole range of reasons for that. There might be, uh, there's negative connotations uh, that surround us talking about money, partly, let's say, down to those who would preach prosperity gospel. And if you give enough money, God will bless you. And in wanting to avoid that, we don't talk about money at all. Or we think of it as though the church only wants money. And if you have at home on TV, you'll know what I'm talking about. Be very careful with what you're watching. There's a whole lot of fraud and false teaching out when it comes to money. And so because we want to avoid that, we don't talk about it at all. For some people it might be embarrassing to talk about money. Maybe there's a kind of stigma around where we get into the game of comparing what I've got with what you've got and there can be a whole kind of shame around, well, I don't have as much as this person. For some, there's a sense of privacy around money where this is, this is my business. The church has got no business talking about this because this is mine and I will hold on to what's mine. Some of us don't like to feel challenged about what we have or how we spend our money, and so we, we just keep quiet and we don't talk about it. And yet, you know, the Bible has so much to say about money. Not just those few select verses that you will often hear taken away out of context and used to justify shameful things, not just those few verses, but, but all kinds of stuff. You know, money is the subject of nearly uh, half of the parables that Jesus told. One out of seven verses in the New Testament is about money. In your Bible, if you were to go through, there are uh, 500 verses on prayer. There are less than 500 verses on faith, but there are more than 2,000 verses that talk about money. 
15% of Jesus' teaching is about money or possessions. He teaches more about money than he does about heaven and hell combined. How you earn it, how you spend it, how you save it. And you know, our attitudes to money reveals a lot. Jesus says, Matthew 6, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart are as well. The NIV, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You see, our attitude to money reveals a lot. Martin Luther once said that there are three conversions. Three conversions that a person needs to uh, experience. The conversion of his head, the conversion of his heart, and the conversion of his pocket. You know, there's some truth in that. There's some truth in that. Let's read 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 1 to 15. Feel free to follow. I'll read from the New Living. So if you uh, have got a, a church Bible, it might be easier to follow on the screen for this one. Uh, but do make a Bible available. Uh, we'll, we'll be flicking through some verses a little bit later on. Paul writes, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. As the scriptures say, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had I want to look this morning at three uh, common questions about giving that this passage raises. And, uh, you know, one trap that we fall into when we think about what the Bible has to say about money is, is well, it's not just talking about giving to the church. That takes up the tiniest proportion of those verses that we see in Scripture about money, and yet it makes up the largest part of our mind. Scripture has plenty to say about how we make money and what we do with it and where it should feature in our priorities. But I want this morning, even though it's only a tiny part, I do want this morning to think specifically about our giving to the church. And this isn't one of those churches where all you will ever hear preached about is money. This is the first time I've ever done it in this church. But I do want to go there this morning, not because it's the only aspect of our finances that the Bible is interested in, but because it is an important and valid topic and one which has been raised by our leadership team. So I want to go there. Three questions. Question one. 
Why do I need to give? Why do I need to give? Who likes donuts? One hand, I don't believe it. Okay. We're in church, you can be honest. Who likes donuts? That's better. Okay. I heard a story, there was a man who uh, was, was travelling and he was in an airport and, and while he was waiting for his flight, he, he stopped in, 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 a, in a cafe, you know, those restaurants that you get in the airports, they're massively overpriced. And, and he stopped there and he bought himself a cup of coffee and a bag of donuts. And then he went to look for a seat, there were no seats. Uh, all of the seats were taken, uh, but there was one table where there were two seats and there was a man sitting there. And so he did that kind of awkward thing, have you ever been in that position? Is anyone sitting here? And uh, now he took a seat. So he sat down and uh, he put his coffee on the table. Uh, he, he, took his, he put his bags down, put the donuts down. He took his jacket off, put his jacket on the chair, sat down, opened his coffee, took a drink. Reached out, uh, picked up a bag of donuts, opened it, took a donut, put the bag back on the table, started eating the donut. The man opposite him, reached out across the table, took this bag, opened it, reached in, took a donut, uh, put the bag back, pushed it back across the table, smiled, and started eating this donut. So what's, what's this man doing? He tried to give him a dodgy look, he, he, he finished something, he, he took the bag again, uh, took out uh, another donut, closed the bag, put it in his corner, started eating this donut. He was too British to say anything else. Uh, the other man reaches across the table into his corner, takes the bag of donuts, takes a second donut, wraps up the bag, puts it back, pushes it into his corner, smiles, thank you very much, starts eating this second. This man says, what are you doing? I don't believe what this man's doing. This other man, uh, he got up to go. Before he went, there was one donut left in the bag. Before this man went, uh, he, he took the bag again, took out the last donut, broke it in half, put one half in his mouth, put the other half back in the bag, <laughs> pushed it to the man, smiled, good day, and off he went. This man's like, I'm not touching that half a donut. That man's full of infection, what's he doing to you? <coughs> Could not speak, he was so angry. They called for his flight. This man went to go, he, he got up, put, put his jacket on, uh, put his coffee in the bin, went to pick up his bag. There on his bag was his bag of donuts. <laughs> You see, this man thought that the other guy was, was stealing all his donuts when in fact the other guy was sharing his donuts. Friends, here's the deal God owns all the donuts. Yeah? God owns all the donuts. And so as we start to think about giving, why do we give? Firstly, we need to have that mindset that everything we have belongs to God. Everything that we have belongs to God and, and he entrusts us with it. He entrusts us with everything we have to, to be wise stewards of it. Verse 1, I want you to know what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy which has overflowed in rich Generosity. You see, generosity is a mindset. It's a mindset. It starts with knowing that everything we have belongs to God. Generosity, says Paul, is the product of joy which has been brought about in our lives by God. So we give because it's a mindset. Secondly, giving is a ministry. Verse 6. He says, So we have urged Titus, who encouraged you, uh, your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Why is giving a ministry? Because God works through 
what we are able to do. There was a preacher uh, who preached once on Revelation 22:17. 17, says, let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And so this guy preaches on this for his service, and afterwards, uh, at the end of the service, he, he announced an offering. And so after the service, a, a lady came up to him, and, uh, and as, as ladies often do after the service, they, they'll, they'll come with some uh, suggestion. And a lady came afterwards to him and said, well, how can you reconcile the, the freeness of the water of life with, with the collection? The preacher said, well, madam, God gives the water without money, but you have to pay for the water lines. You have to pay for the pipes. You have to pay for the buckets that will carry that water. You see, that's true, isn't it? The gospel is free. I will clarify that again. The gospel is free, and praise God for that, and we will always guard that. But as God's people, as God's people, we have a responsibility to steward our our time, our energy, our gifts, our financial resources in a way that facilitate the spread of that gospel. And so giving is a ministry. The Macedonian church recognised how important it was. They recognised how rewarding it was to have a a personal stake in the spread of the gospel. It's why we see verse 4. They they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in that gift. The privilege of sharing. So giving is a mindset. It's a ministry. Thirdly, our giving is, is worship. Worship. Verse 5 says their their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. Their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. And giving is then an overflow of our worship. Paul says also that giving is also a, a test of our worship. This is where it gets uncomfortable. Paul says, giving is a, a test of our worship. Verse 8 says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. It's a test. Hear these words from 1 John. If you're turning, it's near the back. 1 John 3. From verse 16 says this, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, he says, verse 18, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. of our worship. Because, you know, worship goes hand in hand with justice. I'm not going to go deep into that now. There's there's plenty of space for that. Amos 5, for example, uh, God speaks to Amos and and he says to to people in in, in no uncertain terms, I I hate your worship, I I hate your singing, I, I hate your church services, and yet he says, but let justice roll on like You see, we should give in such a way to bring about equality. Verse 13, of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Verse 14, right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. When I was growing up, there was, there was a time when uh, parents didn't have a lot of money and, and I needed uh, new shoes and, and those shoes weren't forthcoming and there was, there was a, a guy in the church uh, who, who heard this and, and turns up one Sunday and presented me with a box with new shoes and simply said, when you can, do the same for someone else. Fast forward about 20 years, 
shortly after, after Hazel and I were married and we were uh, in, in difficult places, there was one of us working and, and things were tight and, and the minister of our church at the time one day came up and, and, and put in our hand an envelope and in that envelope, just at the time we needed it, was a cheque. And at that time, he simply said, do the same for someone else. You see, we give in such a way that over time, we bring about equality. It's the test of our worship. And finally, we give because as we give, we grow. You know, our attitude to money is, is telling. One way of assessing our maturity of believers, but one of the last parts to be converted is our pockets. Think of Luther, conversion of the head, the heart, finally the pocket. And one pastor spoke of the pockets being one of the most hardest parts to, to baptise. And he said, don't be like the man who, who was baptised with his hand in the air, so he was holding his wallet up so it wouldn't go under the water. You know, we can, be, we can be great at many things, but still hold so tightly to our coins that we make the queen cry. <laughs> we can be good at so many other things, but still not be good at giving. Verse 7, since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love, I want you to excel as well in this act of giving. You see, it's vital that to be fully mature as believers, we grow in this as well. It's vital so that all those other things, our, our love, our teaching, all of those things, so that they can spread, our giving has to be on point too. two. If you've got chicken in the oven for lunch, I'm sorry, it's going to burn. Uh, question two. How do we give? How do we give? Firstly, by choice. By choice. Now I recognise that there are parts of the church where there is so much pressure put on giving where you can be feel so forced to give. And I want to make it clear, this is not one of those churches. It is not. And it will never be. The Macedonian church, it says about them, verse 3, that they gave not only what they could afford to, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. Verse 8, so Paul says to them, I'm not commanding you to do this. Jonathan, close your ears a minute. If there is ever a time when you find yourself giving money because you feel forced to, please put that money back in your pocket. Take things off. We give by choice. Secondly, how should we give? We should give eagerly. Verse 8, I'm not commanding you to do this. I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. Verse 11, now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Verse 12, whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. Are you seeing a pattern? Are you seeing a pattern? Three times we should be eager. He's saying we shouldn't be reluctant to, to part with our pennies, that you know, offering time should be the, the happiest point in the service, not the most uncomfortable because we're being forced to part with your hard-earned cash and you don't want to, and you certainly don't want anybody else to see how much or how little you're putting in. No, the offering isn't the interval in the service before we start on the important stuff. Paul sets up a competition. How excited are you? How keen are you to contribute to the ministry of God's church compared to those other believers over there? Can you be more excited than them? He says give eagerly. Thirdly, give consistently. Verse 10, here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give and you were the first to begin doing it. Now, you should finish what you started. 
Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. You see, the mindset and the lifestyle of generosity that Paul is encouraging in the church isn't just a one-off gift. That's the easy bit. It's easy to make a donation to a one-off cause. It's much harder to sustain a ministry long-term. But you know, nothing else changes. The fact that everything in your hand, everything in your pocket belongs to God doesn't change. God's goodness to you and the worship that is due to him does not change. The need amongst his people for the spread of the gospel and for faithful and compassionate ministry and equality does not change. If anything, it grows. It is so important to be able to sustain our giving. The Macedonians, verse 4, it said they, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing. Why do we give? It's a mindset, it's a ministry, it's worship uh, for growth. How do we give? By choice, eagerly and consistently. Question three, uh, and this is the big one, uh, how much should I give? How much should we give? I'm going to get a drink for this one. Let's start in the Old Testament. If you've got a Bible, uh, keep it with you. We're going to be flicking through some Old Testament pages uh, very quickly. If you can't keep up, I apologise, but I'm not going to wait for you too long. Leviticus 27.30, near the beginning, says this, one-tenth. So as we think about giving and and the Old Testament, I can guarantee one of our first thoughts is, okay, we give 10% because that's our time. Yeah? Okay, this is where it's from. Leviticus 27, verse 30, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. There's your tithe. Okay? What's that for? Numbers 18. You don't need to turn. Uh, Elaborates on that and says that that tithe is there to support the ministry of the priests. Hallelujah. That tithe is there uh, to basically pay for the the priests. Uh, Now, Malachi. If you find Matthew, turn back one page. Right at the end of your Old Testament, Malachi. Chapter 3, verse 8. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me, but you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? God says, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to You see, to avoid that 10% tithe uh, under law was to rob God. That's the 10%. But, don't turn. Deuteronomy 12, in addition to that 10%, let's call that the Lord's tithe. Levitical tithe, the Lord's tithe, whatever you want. In addition to that, Deuteronomy 12 uh, gives, in law, a festival tithe. Which was a second 10% which would take effect when Israel got into the promised land to pay for their celebrations every year. So that they could build up their celebrations, they could uh, gel as a community, another 10%. So already, under law, we are up to 20%. Tithe. (coughs) Turn with me for this one, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 14. So we're at 20, someone keep count. Uh, Deuteronomy 14. Verse 28. At the end of every third year, bring the entire tithe of that year's harvest and store it in the nearest town. Give it to the Levites who will receive no allotment of land among you, as well as to the foreigners living among you, the orphans and the widows in your towns, so they can eat and be satisfied. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all (coughs) your work. So we're at 20%. And now there's another tithe. A tithe for the poor. It was a welfare system, if you like. Now this isn't 10% a year, it's 10% every three years, so 3.3% every year. We're at 23.3% of your income under law is a tithe. 
Come on, keep count. 23.3. Leviticus. Leviticus 19. Difficult to handle. Leviticus 19. Verse 9. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Don't strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines. Uh, do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. See, this one's not a tithe as such, but it's, it's, it's if you like, further means that are set down in law to support the poor so, so that people who couldn't afford could, could glean and go and take what was left. In other words, it's saying don't use up everything that you have. Don't assume that everything that you have belongs to you. Remember, God owns all the donuts. Don't use everything. Nehemiah. Just one verse, don't worry about turning, I'll read it to you. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 32. In addition, we promise to obey the command to pay the annual temple tax of one-eighth of an ounce of silver for the care of the temple of our God. In other words, in addition to all of that, as and when there was a need, people would provide additional support for the needs of quarter of your income without fail to fund the ministry of the priests, to fund the activities and the celebrations of the religious community and to support the poor. It's there in the law. And then any additional offerings that you felt able to make, you know, that there was, there was no law for those, but once you've done all your legal bits, you've, you've, you've kissed goodbye to a quarter of your income, if you then wanted to give more by way of free will offerings, you were, you were encouraged to do that as well. Uh, Exodus. Exodus 25. Tell me this. This one's a good one. Turn, turn for this. Exodus 25. <coughs> Verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel, to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept the contributions from all those whose hearts are moved to offer them. So anyone that feels like they want to give, take that offering. Fantastic. Now, we flip forward a few pages. Exodus 36. Verse 5. The craftsmen, these people, they went to Moses and reported, the people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women, don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. So, so on top of the quarter of their income that they had to give, there was an invitation, if you want to, you can give some more. And people gave so much that Moses had to say, no, stop giving, stop giving. We've got plenty. That's not a problem that I've had yet. You see, giving, as you look at the Old Testament, isn't about the 10%. People were so forthcoming in their giving, they had to be told to stop. Even when it was under law. Today we don't come under that law. We're under grace, not law. We're not obliged by law to give 23.3% of our income to the church. It would be nice, but we're not. Verse 7 talks about this gracious act of giving. Verse 9 says that our giving should reflect the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our giving today is more about grace than law. Uh, the percentages don't feature, but the principle still applies. The principle still applies. God owns all the donuts. How much should we give? Firstly, the passage says that what you give should be proportionate. Verse 2, they are being tested by 
many troubles. And they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. You see, the passage doesn't give a number, but it does give an attitude. We're not told a number how much we should give, we're told how we should give. Verse 11. Give in proportion to what you have. And switch relative. Don't compare yourself with the person sitting next to you. Don't try and sneak and look at how much they're putting in the bag before you reveal your hand. It does not matter. No amount is too big. No amount is too small. It depends on what you have and your attitude towards it. It says give proportionately. Secondly, Whatever you can, give eagerly. Whatever you can give happily, that is what you should give. Verse 12. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. Jonathan, close your ears again. If you do not want to give, don't. Put it back in your pocket. Only contribute what you can do happily and not begrudgingly. A preacher once asked a farmer, we're coming to the end, a uh, preacher once uh, said to a farmer, if you had £200, would you give £100 to the Lord? The farmer said, of course I would. Of course I would. The preacher said, okay, if you had two cows... Would you give one cow to the Lord? The farmer said, oh, yes, of course I would. He's my Lord. The preacher said, if you had two pigs, would you give one pig to the Lord? The farmer said, that's not fair. I've got two pigs. I've got two pigs. You see, it was okay in principle until it got specific. Let me talk specifics. Last year, our average weekly income as a church... Uh, from the offering, was £474. Average weekly income from the offering itself was, was considerably less than that, factoring in those who give by direct debit as well. Our average weekly income from the offering and direct debits, £474. Now, assuming there are 50 people in the congregation who are able to to contribute to the weekly offering. Now, there are many more than that, I'm being kind. If there are 50 people, and if each of those 50 people gave uh, on that, that kind of misguided minimum 10% mark, then it would imply that the average annual salary for a person is £5,000. If we're going on 50 people, giving 10% of their income, then we get that the average salary in this country is £5,000 a year. In reality, according to the news last week, it's five times that. Our average weekly outgoings as a church, so income is 474 from offerings, our average weekly outgoings as a church, £1,200. If I can be blunt, our giving as a church is shameful. There is plenty that I can praise this church for. There's many things that we do well, but I also need to call out where we're missing the mark, and giving is one of those areas. Now, I know that not everybody works. I'm aware of all kinds of family circumstances and financial obligations and retirement and unemployment, all of those things. I hear that. We are not a wealthy church. We never have been, and I doubt we ever will be, and that's fine. As a church, we have a history uh, of God providing for this church at our point of need whenever it's been needed. Fine. Praise God for that. But even with all of that in mind, friends, I'm not convinced that we are doing all we can to honour God with our resources or to support the ministry of the church.
every week or every month, you are given a bag of donuts. In that bag, there's 10 donuts. Those donuts will be different sizes. Some of you will have big donuts, some of you will have small donuts, but all of you, every week or every month, will have a bag of 10 donuts. Now, take one of those donuts and you give it to the church. We've just said that's not accurate, it's oversimplified, but even that would be an improvement on what we currently have. You're left with nine. Some of you don't need those nine donuts. Some of you do. Many of you won't need those extra nine donuts. Maybe you're in a position to help a little bit extra. Verse 14. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can, uh, and can, what? And can share with you when you need it. You see, don't hold on to those extra donuts that you don't need just because you have them. It's not good for you. Donuts in general are not good for you. I'm not going to eat these. Don't hold on to them just because you've got them. Verse 15. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. It's quoting the story from Exodus. You find it in Exodus 16, how when God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness, every household, it said, was instructed to, to gather as much as their individual house needed. But nothing more. More. You'll know the story, it goes on. Those, those who took in loads of extra by morning, it was, it was rotten and gone. They couldn't do anything with it. I wonder. What does the way that you view and spend your money say about you? Like Jesus said, does the location of your money reflect the location of your heart? I wonder, do you give out of obligation or out of worship? I wonder, do you need a reminder today that God owns all the donuts? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your gracious provision for each other. We thank you for your grace that you poured out for us. Lord, may we have a sense of that grace too. Thank you for the way in which you Provide for us, week in, week out, month in, month out. Would you forgive us for the times that we have held on to what you've given us just because we have it? Would you give us courage to uh, steward the resources that you give us in ways that honour you. Not because we have to, but because we want to. May the way we steward our money reflect our worship of you. Would you give us courage to be generous, uh, joyfully generous, 
Would you give us opportunities to uh, see the effects of uh, sharing and the ministry of your people? May the money that you have entrusted to us be a blessing uh, to many. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Let's uh, stand and sing together. All to Jesus, I surrender. And as we sing, let's not just surrender our head, let's not just surrender our heart, let's think about our pockets too. And uh, conveniently as we sing, we will take up our offering, please. <laughs>